the sound of the advice to us that the broadcast is now starting. Um, welcome to the APA's webinar on um, literary publishing and commercial value. Uh, for um, We're broadcasting in pictures as well as in audio today. I kind of, I feel more relaxed in audio only for reasons that will no doubt be um, obvious to everybody that's out there. You're all at the moment in listen only mode. Um, that makes the audio quality better. You don't get feedback from each other. Um, but it does mean that the way that you can communicate with us is through typing questions. You should be able to see, if you haven't done one of these before, um, have a look around the screen and you'll find that there's a section called questions. Um, we will be keeping an eye on that. You can't see that, but Gillian is sitting on the other side of the camera and watching carefully to see the questions that come in. Please type a question at any time. Um, we won't be taking questions all uh, until kind of a natural break in the presentation. But please, you know, if a thought occurs to you, the advantage of having a place where you can type it is that you can just type it down at any time. And um, Gillian will keep an eye on that and we'll draw our attention to it a little bit later. And I was very happy to take questions. You can, <clears throat> you can also use that to let us know of any technical questions and um, Gillian should be able to help you with that along the way. I am delighted to welcome today Professor Ivar Indik as well as being the director of Giramondo Publishing, which is how most of you will probably know him. He is also the Whitlam Professor in the Writing and Society Research Centre at Western Sydney University. He was the founding editor of Heat, the co-founder of the Sydney Review of Books, and he has written uh, as, as an author on many aspects of Australian literature, art, architecture and literary publishing. Has, I'm not sure whether anybody has had more success in the Prime Minister's Literary Awards. No, right? I, um, I think over the last couple of years, um, uh, for those of you who have watched the Prime Minister's Literary Awards, the winners in poetry and fiction, um, and fiction um, uh, Giramondo has done, and not just last year, I think I've seen you win uh, over a number of years. Yes, I think we've got five or six. Yes. So, so, so if there is um, someone who knows something about publishing works that are recognised by at least the jury of the Prime Minister's Literary Awards, then it's either in the, um, Some of you who were attending the Melbourne Writers' Festival recently may have heard a lecture that he presented in the Boisbouvier um, oration. Sounds like Jack and Anassas, but um, uh, I, I'm told that he will be reprising some of the themes of that today. This is not quite the sort of our normal fare of practical how-to, but a, a bit of a foray into some ruminations about uh, the, the broader issues of one part of publishing. I'm delighted you're all there, and I'm very um, pleased to welcome to the APA. Um, Ivor Indic. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, well, as Michael mentioned, the uh, publicity for this talk um, has me declaring that Australian literary publishing is inherently provincial because it occupies an outlying territory which is unknown to most readers. Um, that doesn't mean its content uh, or its appeal is provincial, but the sense of isolation, because uh, paradoxically, uh, uh, literary, independent literary publishers tend to be really well connected internationally, even if unknown domestically. But the sense of isolation is real enough. So you could think of this webinar as a transmission from the edges of the known world of publishing. And if there's some static that enters uh, during the broadcast, that would be all for the purpose, I think. Who is this strange fellow who is a professor as well as a publisher? whose training was in uh, scholarly research, literary research, not in publishing, and who even now depends on the academy for his income and support because the books he publishes have only a limited appeal. What would he know about the business of publishing? And that's essentially the question which I'm about to address. In fact, uh, my talk is about uh, um, the vexed uh, nature uh, of literary publishing in commercial terms the vexed relationship between literary publishing and commercial value. Or to put it another way, is a question, because we're all practical people here, how do you make a business out of literary publishing? I should say from the start that what makes this topic a vexed one is that there is no necessary relationship 
between literary publishing and commercial value. Perhaps one should put this more strongly. Uh, if there is a relationship, it is likely to be an inverse one. That is to say, the more literary the book, the less likely it is to succeed in the marketplace. Though, of course, it might come to be considered successful in other terms. The kind of book which most exemplifies this inverted relationship is, of course, poetry. Poetry books are hard to find in most bookshops. Poets generally are scorned by writers' festivals. They are excluded from literary awards like the Stella Prize, which reward women's writing but exclude women poets. They find it hard to win grants from funding bodies like the Australia Council. The general assumption is that poetry is difficult. Difficulty is generally regarded as one of the hallmarks of literature, of literariness, but it is the mark of the devil in the marketplace. Contrary to popular opinion, difficulty does not mean that literary works have to be opaque or impossible to understand. The, the difficulty in literary works lies in the way they play against or unsettle expectation. They are saying something new or unfamiliar, countenancing possibilities of meaning and challenging old assumptions. The difficulty may reside simply in a certain way with language or in implications that cannot easily be decided or in a resistance to habitual ways of thinking. Poetry uh, by its nature uh, presents these kinds of resistance in a compressed form. It requires a certain openness in readers that they are not always prepared to allow. Poets therefore pay a high price for their allegiance to the literary. A new poetry collection by Les Murray, an iconic figure in his heyday, would have had sales that were small when compared to those of a modestly successful and now forgotten novel of the time. And because Murray was well known for his ideas as much as for his poetry, his sales would actually have been much better, indeed double, those of his equally significant but less well-known fellow poets, uh, for whom 500 copies, or at best 750 to 1,000, of a new collection would have been the norm. Poets, really important poets like David Campbell, James Macaulay, Robert Gray, Vicky Vidicas, Jennifer Maiden or John Forbes. Neither prizes nor good reviews could boost them into a higher sales bracket. There's only one thing that can increase markedly the sales of a poetry book, and that is an educational adoption. Not to university courses necessarily, unless it is to a large <coughs> first year course, uh, otherwise the numbers will be quite small. But high school adoptions are another matter especially if they are lower level courses with larger numbers of students. Angus and Robertson, and when it, when it existed, and the uh, University of Queensland Press used to cater to this market by producing special editions of selected poems by carefully chosen poets. In the 20 year period from 1970 to 1990, 100,000 copies of Judith Wright's selected uh, poems selected and collected poems were printed uh, for use by students. During the same period, Les Murray's selected poems, as opposed to his individual collections, which at best you know, sold 3,000 copies, but his selected poems for high school study sold almost 35,000 copies. Kenneth Slesser's selected poems, 74,000 uh, copies, half of them in the five years leading up to the bicentennial in 1988. In the period 1981 to 1989, 15,000 copies of Gwen Harwood's selected poems were printed. In other words, a high school adoption could boost the sales of a poetry book by 2,000 to 5,000 copies a year. Year after year, not just one year, year after year, dwarfing the sales of an individual collection if, of course, you are one of the lucky few to be chosen for adoption. Interestingly, though fiction <coughs> offers a much more buoyant market uh, than poetry does, the same importance of high school adoptions to the economy of literary publishing can be observed in the case of fiction too. My colleague in publishing, my distinguished colleague in publishing, Bruce Sims, 
undertook a study of the profitability of Australian fiction published by Penguin during this same period, the 1970s and 1980s, when he was working as the fiction editor there alongside the legendary Brian Johns. These were halcyon years in which the novel was leading the way in discussions of the national culture. And yet, Sims concluded, on average, over the whole period, the adult fiction list was at best only close to breaking even and may well have been below this benchmark. What brought it close to the break-even point was the large sales achieved by only a handful of books, which were listed for study in high schools. Tim Winton's Cloud Street, David Maloof's John O and Fly Away Peter, Jessica Anderson's Tirolira by the River, uh, Nicholas Jose's Paper Nautilus, Helen Garner's Monkey Grip, or uh, Ruth Park's Harp in the South. The conclusion seems clear, if a little shocking. We owe the publishing, the, indeed the existence of Australian literature in book form, contemporary book form, not to adult readers, of whom there are relatively few, but to school children, since it is educational adoptions which form an essential part of the literary economy, or it used to. It is important not to underestimate the effects of uh, an outpouring of national sentiment, the effect an outpouring of national sentiment can have on the sales of Australian literature. Um, the period from which I have been drawing my examples, the period between the two bicentennials, 1970 and 1988, was relatively speaking a boom time for Australian literature, fiction, non-fiction and poetry. And there were other factors involved. Australian literature enjoyed a brief but popular reign in the universities uh, in the early 1980s and early 1990s. I know because I was part of it with Leonie Kramer at Sydney University, one of the first majors in Australia, or the first major in Australian literature. Uh, before the arrival of cultural studies ended what came to be regarded as literature's unjustly privileged status. The first wave of feminism found strong voices in writers like Elizabeth Jolly, Jean Bedford, Kate Grenville, Amy Whitting, Beverly Farmer, Drusilla Majeska, with sales figures for their books in the tens of thousands. Again, I know uh, how ephemeral this was really because I published Beverly Farmer in the 2000s and uh, the sales were down from many thousand, tens or fifteens of thousands uh, to under 1,000. Very dramatic uh, change in fortune. The Penguin Book, and I, I, I'm going back to that period of the 80s again, the Penguin Book of Australian Women Poets, uh, published in 1986, sold 20,000 copies, huge amount for an anthology. Uh, indigenous writing too was in its first flush Kevin Gilbert's anthology, Inside Black Australia, which was published in the bicentennial year 1988, sold 17,000 copies. Ruby Langford's autobiography, Don't Take Your Love to Town, the publication of which in 1988 coincided also, and more significantly, with the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody, sold over 30,000 copies. I, the figure would be higher now, I think. The big multinational publishers like Random House, Pan Macmillan and Harper Collins, with their published for profit regimes had yet to come into town. Within 10 years, everything had changed. We will have to wait a long time for another centennial outpouring of national sentiment. Australian literature began to disappear from the universities and high schools. There are very few selected and collected poems being published now, largely because there is no demand for them. The multinational publishers and even the larger independents have no time for a genre like poetry that can manage to sell at best, at very best, only a thousand copies of a new title. Indeed, they don't publish poetry at all. Nowadays, in fact, a thousand copies is looking wildly optimistic as a target for a poetry book. Uh, as I know from experience, new poetry titles, even by the best, the most highly regarded contemporary poets, struggle to sell more than 300 copies. One of our two national newspapers has a policy of not reviewing poetry titles at all. 
So I guess the question I posed at the beginning of my talk could be put in this way. How can you make a business out of publishing poetry when you can expect to sell only 300 copies of each title, and even then, not immediately, uh, but over a period of some years? I mean, if a poetry book is reviewed, it's likely to take 12 months to appear in the first place. The answer is a practical one. The average poetry book is around 96 pages in length. If the publisher can manage to get a publishing grant from the Australia Council, this will cover the print and production costs. The average author advance for a poetry book is only $1,000. Most poetry books require little editing. As you might expect, poets are a lot more deliberate, more careful in their use of language and in their crafting than their prose counterparts. The main issue is likely to be formatting and the layout of the poem. As a result, though it is impossible to make a, po a profit on a poetry book, it is possible to break even. Uh, this is all the more the case because uh, technological advances in digital printing have brought down uh, the cost even of, or uh, made the possibility of small print runs, you know, 500 or even less, uh, uh, more economical than they were in the past. The prospect of breaking even is not quite as idyllic as the phrase might suggest. Uh, concealed in the break-even economy is a high degree of patronage, uh, certainly from the poets themselves, because $1,000 is a very poor return for three or more years of hard work. Uh, from the publishing house itself, uh, because to break even when operating costs are not taken into account is actually to operate at a loss, unless of course your overheads are covered at least to some extent by, as in Giramondo's case, a university or some other institution. And uh, from public uh, funding, uh, like the Australia Council, uh, and in the case of Giramondo, Western Sydney University, whose sponsorship helps to cover those losses. Uh, in a way, this is not surprising. All art forms in Australia and elsewhere require patronage uh, if they are to develop their full potential. Unlike the other art forms, literature is not uh, particularly attractive to corporate sponsorship, be probably because it is not generally visible in its practice and allows few opportunities for social identification and promotional display. In the case of poetry, its social dimension uh, is essentially, in any case, largely communal. Poetry books are most likely to be bought by poets, the sector of the reading public uh, that can least afford them. In that purchase, there is, as a result, an expression of commitment and identification. Since the books may not be available in bookshops, well, unlikely to be available uh, in bookshops, um, a considerable proportion of poetry sales are made directly by the poets themselves at their own gigs or at launches, readings or by online sales uh, through the publisher's website. Though it is informal, there is an economy here which benefits both author and publisher because they share the 65% of the recommended retail price of the book that would normally go to the bookseller and the distributor. And the sense of community can itself have economic consequences. Many of the poets we publish have won or been shortlisted for major literary prizes, not just in Australia, but overseas. The two largest of those prizes were worth $200,000 and $100,000 respectively to the poets who won them. But even at 20,000 or 30,000, which is the normal size, the prize represents 20 or 30 times more uh, than the poet might expect from royalty on sales. In other words, the sales are not, uh, for this reason and for others, uh, an indication uh, of the importance or even uh, uh, the economic return on the book. The literary uh, reputation of Giramondo plays, and, and reputation is really an essential part of the literary economy, uh, far more than it is in the case of commercial publishing. Uh, the literary reputation of Giramondo plays a role in the grant success of the poets it publishes and in the award of scholarships for doctoral studies 
at universities. The value of these awards, uh, scholarships, for example, for doctoral study, can be as high as eighty thousand, eighty thousand to ninety thousand uh, dollars over three years. Giramondo itself does not receive any of this money uh, and does not benefit from any appreciable increase in sales as a result of the awards. But it does benefit from the work that results from the time bought by the awards and by making a major con and by itself making a major contribution to the vitality of the poetry community. Each award adds to Giramondo's reputation and in the literary community it is reputation that is the real mark of value, uh, not sales. And I just, just an aside on this question of reputation, uh, it explains why our books um, have, we, we place a, a, a big weight, uh, a big importance on design, and why there is a kind of uniformity of design through all our books, uh, because uh, uh, what's called the brand uh, is essential to uh, the integrity uh, and uh, uh, the reputation of literary publishing. Well, that's all I wanted to say about poetry. Um, I was going to go on and talk about fiction or non-fiction and the other genres, uh, but we can pause there if you like. Are there have any questions? Yes. So I should just. Um, yeah, yes. Well, I, I'm, I'm, I would like to hear some more in a minute, um, uh, or perhaps at the end, about um, reputation in particular, but. Um, why don't you press on, yes. and, and then we'll take questions at the end. I mean, once again, you know, encourage people that if you've got any thoughts or any questions that you'd like to pick up, uh, then type them in. I mean, you might disagree completely, which is fine. We can talk about that too. <laughs> um, I've taken the poetry collection as the touchstone for discussing the inverse relationship between literary quality and commercial value. But it is not the only genre that suffers from uh, public neglect or ignorance even. A collection of literary essays is also likely to sell around 500 copies or less, uh, unless it has a hook like illness or madness uh, to give it a wider appeal. Though even then, in my experience, it, its reach is unlikely to be much more than 2,000 copies. The novella uh, also suffers simply because it is short. Presumably, Australian readers like to feel they are getting value for their money, measured in terms of pages in the first instance. So publishers, uh, commercial publishers tend to treat short novels as if they were long novels by uh, increasing the size of the font uh, and decreasing the size of the format, uh, thus giving it more page numbers. From my point of view, uh, the concentration and resonance of the novel, of the novella, enhances its literary quality in similar ways to that of the poem. Indeed, there can be a considerable overlap between the two genres. I guess the best example would be David Maloof, who's both a poet and a fiction writer, and his um, achievement really is in the novella. Um, Fly Away Peter, John o, uh, Ransom, for example, all very short books. And he can get away with it but uh, because he's a poet, because of his huge reputation. But other writers, I think, find it much more difficult. In some uh, cultures, particularly in South America and Europe, the novella is the dominant mode of fiction, the one which shows the greatest artistry. But novellas don't do well when brought into this country in translation, and not only because they are novellas, Australian readers don't show much interest in the translation of a literary work unless uh, it has been a bestseller or won a major pri prize overseas, like the Booker International uh, or the Dublin uh, Prize. Uh, once again, uh, with translation, uh, so it's not just the fact that it's in novellas, but the genre of literary translation uh, puts us in the category of 500 copies or less. But here too, there is an unexpected economy at work. Many overseas governments offer grants for the publication of their literary works in English, and this covers the cost of their translation. And while sales of literary translations are not buoyant in this country, they are in the US and the UK with their larger populations, uh, where such books uh, are eligible for literary prizes. Consequently, 
if we commission a translation for publication in Australia, we have a good chance of selling the rights to it overseas. A prospect which offers extra income, however modest, but what is more important in the long term, an enhancement of our international reputation uh, as a literary publisher. It is interesting to imagine how Australian literary publishing, which is an outlying and barely regarded uh, province of mainstream Australian publishing, could precisely for this reason carry an allure on the international stage. Fiction is a difficult and risky category uh, for a literary publisher. So paradoxically, fiction is the most attractive uh, uh, lit, uh, uh, genre for uh, commercial publishers simply because it's the most, perhaps even the only uh, category uh, which carries commercial appeal. But precisely for this reason, uh, uh, it's a risky business fiction for independent literary publishers. Um, the commercial publishers and large independents create a demand for fiction and offer competitive advances which are difficult for purely literary publishers to meet. Even if we were able to meet these demands, the outcome would still be highly risky since we lack the powerful distribution, marketing and publicity resources which the large publishers have at their command and which ensure a reasonable return on their initial outlay. There is a chance too that we would have to spend a good deal of time on editing, a big cost for us in order to bring the book up to a literary standard. Here it is important to distinguish between what the market calls literary fiction and the kind of fiction that might in time come to be called literature. In general, literary fiction is a term used in the marketplace to indicate a category of fiction which is distinct from genre fiction. That is to say, it's not crime fiction, fantasy, romance, spy fiction, horror, and the like. There, uh, is, there may be a claim to superiority in the use of the term literary fiction, uh, but it is so widely used now and so devalued in its use as to be more the description of a marketing category than an assurance of quality. Giramondo has published three of the most highly regarded writers of fiction in the country, uh, Alexis Wright, Gerald Manane, and Brian Castro. And it is interesting to consider what this has meant in commercial terms. First of all, none of these writers were scouted. The books we published were, to begin with, considered uncommercial. The story is well known. Alexis Wright's Carpenteria had been rejected by every major publisher in the country. It is now a national classic. The same is true of Brian Castro's Shanghai Dancing. It went on to win both the Victorian and the New South Wales Premier's Literary Awards. What was risky about these two novels from a commercial point of view, their style of writing and manner of storytelling, was precisely what was attractive to us from a literary point of view. Gerald Manane's reputation was languishing when we first began publishing him. None of his previous seven works of fiction had had uh, substantial sales, including his best known work, The Plains, the sales of which had been modest and probably buoyed by its listing for a number of university courses on postmodern literature. Most of his titles were out of print. He was so dispirited that he had stopped writing for over a decade. In the 13 years after we started publishing Manane's books in 2005, both the new works and the reprinted titles, the situation did not change very much. The reputation was there and enhanced with each new book, but the sales remained low less than 1,000 copies, sometimes much less than 1,000 copies in most cases, with only Barley Patch, Manane's first new work of fiction to be published after a 14-year hiatus, selling a little above that figure, that is to say 1,000 copies. And there his work might have remained, little known but highly regarded, were it not for, were it not that Farris Strauss Giroux, the great American literary publisher, chose to publish his two most recent books 
border districts and a collection of his short fiction. When FSG, uh, Farah strauss publishes uh, an author, the rest of the literary world immediately pays attention and often follows suit. In the year following their publication, we were able to negotiate foreign rights for Monet's titles with publishers in Germany, Greece, Spain, Italy, Denmark, the UK, Egypt and China. I imagine the text uh, which published The Plains also had a similar success. Even more important, at least as far as Australian readers were concerned, was the publicity generated by FSG's publication, the fact of FSG's publication uh, of the books, and in particular, an essay in the New York Times magazine, which suggested that Monet might be, quote, the greatest living English language writer most people have never heard of, end quote, and a likely Nobel Prize winner. In truth, he had been touted as a Nobel Prize winner in the years previously, uh, sometimes at odds as close as 15 to 1, but everybody regarded it as a bit of a joke. A well-known Sydney broadcaster suggested on the air when uh, the New York Times magazine story broke that the whole thing might be a hoax since he'd never heard the name Gerald the name before. So assured is the Vox Popular that it knows what is going on in the world. Australian readers are so lacking in confidence uh, that they really need overseas success to be convinced of the worth of their own literary achievements. The American publicity generated Australian publicity and Australian curiosity. Border Districts was shortlisted for the Miles Franklin Award, something that had never happened, uh, had never even been a remote prospect for his earlier works of fiction, and won the Prime Minister's Award for fiction. It topped 4,000 copies in sales, and the collected short fiction, the companion, companion volume, 2,000 copies. The first time ever, Monet's titles had reached that uh, level uh, in the a period soon after publication. Even though, uh, even so, though the increase in sales was welcome, these are not large figures. In fact, they're very small. I remember Monet's publisher at Zorkamp, a really great quality German literary publisher, describing the early sales of their German edition of Border Districts as homeopathic. <laughs> I think this is a wonderful description, if you believe in homeopathy. It carries the assurance of large consequences from very small initial causes, which is precisely the logic by which literary publishing exists, or at least the faith by which literary publishing exists. Alexis Wright's Carpenteria and her subsequent books, the novel The Swan Book and the collective biography Tracker, have all benefited from this logic. Thirteen years after its publication, which is a relatively short period, I think, Carpenteria is seen as an Australian classic. When it won the Miles Franklin Award, it was for a brief period of time in the bestseller category. Now it is listed for high school and university studies and sells regularly in the modest numbers a new literary novel might achieve, only it does so year after year and is likely to do so into the future. The same trajectory is being followed by the Swan Book, slow to start as Carpenteria was, and without the benefit of the prizes that Carpenteria won, it too is selling regularly as a backlist title, as a classic of climate change and migration. I would like to conclude uh, by saying something about the phenomenon of the backlist and the nature of time in literary publishing which, as you might have already gathered, is very different to the time by which commercial publishing operates. The backlist uh, is made up of those titles that continue to sell long after the initial enthusiasm for them has died down. In other words, there's a big distinction between the front list, which is made for immediate sale, immediate success, and the backlist, which is predicated on the assumption of a more enduring uh, uh, and wide-ranging uh, kind of success. There aren't many titles that achieve uh, the, the, the status 
of uh, backlist, uh, uh, profitable backlist titles. Uh, and it can take many years for this to come about, especially if it's dependent on educational adoptions, which can take anywhere from six to 10 years after publication uh, uh, to come into effect. But to the extent that a literary publishing is publishing for literary quality in the first case, rather than for commercial value, it follows that their chances of creating a profitable backlist are relatively good. In fact, I would go further and say that because of the unreliability of the initial response to a literary work, uh, the fact that it is likely to be a delayed response anyway, you come to feel that you're publishing from the, for the future, that you're publishing for the future as a literary publisher, uh, rather than simply for the present. Or to put it another way, while you have the greatest regards for the book, greatest regard for the books you are publishing in the present, it is those you have already published mm -hmm. that you remain attentive to and keep in mind and in print for the future. In his book, uh, Merchants of Culture, the publishing business in the 21st century, uh, John Thompson lists the many virtues of an active backlist, that is, of the titles which, by virtue of their quality, uh, continue to be bought by readers. And I quote him, the revenue is relatively predictable and stable from one year to the next. This is certainly the case because it achieves a certain uh, level. Uh, the major investment costs have already been made. No editing, uh, um, production is fairly streamlined, design is settled. Marketing expenditure and promotion and all costs are minimal because the book is essentially selling itself and returns are generally low uh, because people that order them, order them to sell them or to buy them, uh, not speculatively in order to send half, half of them back again. With backlist titles, the publisher is simply reprinting books to meet ongoing demand and the only costs they incur are the costs of printing, the costs of warehousing, which is not that great if they're going out again, and distribution and the royalty payments to the author. i continue the quote, backlist publishing is therefore much more profitable than frontlist publishing. Not only does it make a substantial <laughs> contribution to the publisher's top line, it also makes a disproportionately large contribution to the bottom line. And even with commercial publishers, uh, the backlist uh, can be as much as 50% of their uh, turnover. But this is the thing, it takes a long time to build a backlist. Of the fiction titles as I mentioned, Carpenteria and the Swan Book are now clearly active backlist titles. I mean, I can see that clearly from the sales. Some of Manane's work are well on the way to achieving that status, but it's still uh, uh, early times, I think. Brian Castro's Shanghai Dancing, I regard as a classic in waiting. It may only sell 20 copies a year at the moment. It probably costs us more in warehousing fees than we get in income from those 20 copies. But its reputation is secure, regardless of how many copies are sold. I often reassure myself, if a book is going to be around for a long time, you wouldn't expect it to go charging out of the blocks. It's waiting for the right readers to come along and that could take a generation or two. In the meantime, the mortals who brought it into being will have to find their own ways of survival. And the longer they live, the better, obviously. The only problem with publishing for the future is that it doesn't pay the bills in the present, though it does <coughs> in time. That's my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, Gillian. Are there, are there typed questions? There are not currently typed questions. Um, let me encourage everyone who's uh, on the call to, um, to type away. In, in the meantime, I wonder if I could just go back to the quote that you had about literature's unjustly privileged space. Mm. Um, uh, and, and just ask kind of, you know, as a provocation, um, now, it's all very well to presume that you can see the future or the value in something now that's more likely to be um, good in the future than someone else can. But, but there's a, 
I mean, it's a, it's a reasonable question, isn't it? That, you know, that there's an unjustly privileged status and that, that there's no better way of valuing things than um, the number of people to which they appeal. And that really, you know, it's uh, the idea that something is more valuable somehow because it's, um, I mean, homeopathy is really, you know, we, we shouldn't believe too much in homeopathy. Medicines, alternative medicine will be called medicine if it works. Isn't that the way I can say it? So, so this is all very provocative, Michael. I assume you're playing the devil's advocate. Well, at least, at least a little bit. I, I, I think there, there's at least one, um, there's at least one research proposal at the moment being developed by a university to look at measures of cultural value separate from economic value. And um, I, I think that's an interesting question, but you know, I think it's one that deserves a response. Yes, I mean, look, uh, I don't claim any special privilege um, about publishing for the future. It's really quite a, a foolish thing to do. Um, uh, you lose a lot of, you, can, you know, you lose money that way for sure. Uh, uh, my inability to predict the best seller um, is probably, a de is undoubtedly a deficiency in a publisher. Uh, um, nevertheless, um, you know, the ancients believed that posterity, you know, time uh, proves value, cultural value. And I don't see any reason to doubt that. Um, uh, you know, the things that are really valuable are those that endure. Right. Uh, and they endure because in uh, to different readers and to generation after generation of readers, they offer something new. They keep offering something new. So they must have some quality in them, uh, which persistently um, pushes against the expectation and, you know, allows readers to, to look back on those expectations. and and actually to reenact or enact the process of rethinking and reformulating their assumptions. That's really valuable. So um, when I uh, was first educated uh, in literature, that was in the 1970s, that was the assumption, that was the power of literature. And you know, what we were all doing is in our research was trying to work out what it was in the literary text that allowed that text to survive two, three hundred, five hundred years. So uh, that assumption, which wasn't an assumption about the superiority of literature, but it was an assumption about its power, its cultural power, was severely challenged by cultural studies in the 90s. Uh, and uh, it's around that time that, you know, literature uh, starts disappearing, not only from the names of um, university departments to be replaced by communication <laughs> cultural studies, but from the syllabuses as well, um, and uh, uh, come under ideological suspicion, or under suspicion for being ideological. So the canonical, the idea of the canon and the idea of literature courses that could present a whole view of literature, or of Australian literature, uh, also waned. Uh, and uh, what you find now is Australian literary texts here and there, you know, in other courses, uh, or as an option. Uh, 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 and I think that's been really, really serious, serious uh, deficiency. Um, and uh, it seems to be the case that cultural studies is now suffering an eclipse and its name is disappearing from university courses. So, uh, you know, these things come and go. Indeed. So I don't know if that answers your question. But oh, no, it's I, 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 I do defend the idea of literature uh, as offering something special. <clears throat> Absolutely. I think I think that the discussion about cultural value at the moment is um, driven at least in part by a, a wish to present to policymakers and decision makers the idea that um, that the value of literature, or at least the value of literary works and of novels and nonfiction, is is more to the nation that can, then can be measured by uh, the simple fact of 100 people or 1,000 people having read it. Yes. And, yeah. and, but, but I do think that um, in, in order to make that argument cogently, it needs to be something that is relatively 
quantitative, mm -hmm. but not, not something that's, that is a, a kind of wishy-washy. No, I agree. And that's why I gave those figures, um, you know, for the sale of selected poems in the 80s and 90s or fiction. I, I mean, I was part of a large research project which actually looked at the figures. Um, so they are available, uh, generally, and it is possible, but you have to take a long view. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can't just say, look, this book was successful, it sold 100,000 copies in five years, now no one knows anything about it. That, yeah. Uh, I mean, you've got to separate out that kind of immediate success from something that's more enduring. Yes, yes. No, well, I, I found your, I found your, your um, the rich detail of the figures in your talk particularly interesting. Um, you can tell me if there's any um, okay. questions. And the other thing I wanted to, to ask you um, about was that reference to the, the, the way, I mean, you, know, you, you talked about cultural outpourings and it's going to be yeah. a little while yeah. before, but I mean, that's sort of the impetus to Australian sales from cultural outpourings uh, it is kind of, in a way, on the other, the other end of the dimension that sees us only adopt something domestic when it's been identified as important by FSG. You know, that, and I think the same thing is the same thing has possibly been complained of in um, cinematic culture. That, yeah. You know, we tend to value uh, the stars of ours and perhaps even the works that have been greeted enthusiastically by the large markets of America or Europe, yes. particularly, I guess, America. Um, so, so do you have any do you have any thoughts on 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 that? And I guess in particular, the extent to which that make, makes your thinking um, global rather than domestic. Yes, I mean, absolutely. That I did want to say a bit more about that. The you know we think of the literary publisher, especially one who specialises in poetry uh, or in books that pe people have hardly heard of, um, as provincial. You know, as kind of marginal. Uh, to the, uh, to the life of uh, books. Uh, but in fact, it's that very marginality which uh, promotes an international output because it's natural, you know, to want to ally yourself with other similar uh, marginal publishers in other uh, cultures. Uh, and um, there is an interesting economy there because you tend to, um, in the sale of rights, for example, a lot of it is based on reciprocity, you know. So if, you know, if, if you take this book of mine, you know, I'll take this book of yours. And the act of reciprocity, which is also an act of recognition and solidarity when you're dealing, you know, with people who are so idealistic, um, is paramount in the yeah. exchange. But of course, it also had, so you don't need big advance, you don't need uh, big rights payments. The fact of being published overseas for both of us is really important for our reputations. Uh, but uh, there are economic um, implications as well, because if one of our books is published by a literary uh, publisher overseas, even a small one, we benefit from the publicity and the response. And since there are many uh, more people in America than here, yes. right, so you're going to get it. So the response will be magnified compared to the right, Australian right, right. Yeah. So um, I've got a good example of that, and that's Sunita Perez de Costa's uh, novella, uh, Sordad, which was, uh, I can't tell you uh, uh, how little response there was. Uh, you know, we had to hassle uh, the editor of one of the major national papers to get a thumbnail review months after it came out because he thought it wasn't worth reviewing, and the other one just didn't even regard it. Uh, but I sold the rights to, uh, and it was 20,000 words, and totally uneconomical from a commercial publisher's point of view, but I sold the rights to a published in transit in the United States. Now he's garnering her reviews. And belatedly, 18 months after it came out, it was shortlisted for the Prime Minister's Award, um, which says a lot for the quality of the panelists, for the judging panel of the, uh, the Prime Minister's Award. I mean, they're smart people. It's not always the case. You know. So you depend on uh, um, a, a coalescence of certain factors, but the international one is certainly absolutely fundamental. And it'll be much more uh, income than I can give the yeah. author from yeah. the sales here, which were below 300 copies. Um, she gets uh, the income from, uh, hopefully, from the sales of that book in the US. So then I think practical. And that's the that. second book they've taken from us. So you can see it yeah. builds and builds. Yes. Yeah. 
So let me ask you a practical question about the right sales. Yeah. When, when we've done some surveys of members, um, you know, when we've talked, we've done this as a way of responding in part to uh, Australia Council and other funders of who have supported the presence of Australian publishers at Frankfurt. You know, there is often the question, well, how many sales did you actually make at yeah. this year's fair? And I've often been keen to say, well, to, to emphasise the ways in which the individual fairs are at an earlier stage of the sales funnel. Yeah. You know, it's more about contacts and maintaining. So it's, it, you know, asking about sales is, is um, at, at this particular fair is, you know, ignores the length of time involved. Mm -hmm. but, but what's come back has been that um, of most of the members we've surveyed, the vast bulk of any international like, trade they do is with people that they've physically met, but it's still very much a person-to-person -person business. Is that your experience? Oh, yes, absolutely. And um, <clears throat> But also, um, it, it's a kind of um, solidarity. I'll just stress that yeah, point yeah. again. I mean, it's not just that we have to meet them. It's we're in correspondence with them anyway because we Published the same yes, kinds yeah. of books, and we suffer the same kinds of ignominy, and uh, <laughs> and we have the same sense of persistence and idealism. So it's a community that's really important. And interestingly enough, the sector of the literary uh, world that is most adept at international communication is the poets. The, the the sector that is least regarded in their own country are the most likely to be well connected internationally. And yet, ultimately, I guess that's the kind of thing that I'm finding curious is that, and yet, ultimately, like with, say, Les Murray, it's, it's very much the, the Australianness, the, the kind of the, the sense of, of place and location. That... Uh, I think that, no, I, I disagree. In fact, um, if you're operating at this level of literary publishing, uh, it's not Australianness, it's, um, you know, the quality of the writing, it's uh, the innovative nature. Of the writing. And in fact, when I choose uh, books to publish here in translation into English, um, it's the uh, formal quality of the writing right. because I want to increase the repertoire of skills that is available to Australian writers and readers. Um, and so it's something that's exciting, that's kind of interesting, it doesn't have to be rooted in place, though it may well be. But that, the place is not the primary consideration. And I would think, and I know, uh, that in Bernard's case, that is not the right. Because his place is the plants, it's in his head. It's a, it's a metal lamp. <coughs> sure. So they're not getting off on the wimmer. You know, I, don't, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that's their main interest. Their main interest is what he does with the language and with images uh, and, and uh, with narrative. Any questions? No. Um, and this is but, like selling no, a product. No, no. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Stand by. Waiting, waiting for your call. Um, uh, well, we, 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 we'll, come, we'll just ask you to riff on one, one last thing and then we'll close. And, and that was the, the emphasis that you made on reputation. It's always been, you know, I've always thought that it was a really big challenge for publishers that, that establishing brand was quite difficult. That, you know, that publishers really are selling kind of author by author rather than that it's really quite difficult for publishers to establish a, a, a brand at a publishing or well, certainly a company, but so often even at an imprint yeah, level yeah. that has cut through. But you seem to think that, and I wonder how long it has taken and what the key elements you think have been for you to be able to develop something that at least for your niche of, of you know, your core audience recognises and thinks of as Giramondo yeah. um, uh, imprint as, as being a brand that carries some uh, meaning? Um, look, I think there's a fundamentally different way of thinking about the product between the commercial publishers and the literary publishers. I mean, for the commercial publisher, each book's got to make its own way, right? It's got to make its impact and, and return and profit. Uh, so there's not a lot of virtue in having a, a, a consistency of design across many titles. But for us, the reputation of the publisher is at least as important, or indeed more important than the sales. And I think of every book we publish as contributing to the reputation of the publisher. And that benefits the author who can draw on the reputation of the publisher uh, as on uh, sales. So we really benefited from having a great designer, and that was Harry Williamson. 
and we will have Margaret Grant Design and that Jenny Creek in the future. Um, and also from the fact that we had a magazine before we published books. So uh, he was renowned for its, um, the quality of its writing and for the quality of its design. So in a way, our reputation, our brand, if you like, was established even before we started and was the reason why we started publishing books. And then um, with Harry Williamson's design, that carried right through all of our books. So, we, we so that has been a huge benefit for us. I don't, you know, I don't know why um, other Australian publishers don't realise. So with each commissioning, you're, are you, when, you're, when you're looking at a, a work and an author, you're thinking, you know, does this fit with the... Oh, subconsciously, you know, I don't have a list of qualities that no, I would no. match it off against. But I do think, I mean, I think uh, there was a publisher, I've forgotten his name now, who argued uh, that each book um, that a publisher publishes is like a page in a large book. Right. See? So actually the whole oeuvre uh, is constituted by the books that are published. So each book contributes to the identity of the whole. And since I came from publishing magazine, a magazine in which there were multiple contributors yeah. who all contributed to the issue, yeah. so it seems natural to me to think of Giramondo as in a way like a big magazine. Right, right. So that each book is like a page or an article, an element in that large magazine. Well, uh, I've very much enjoyed your uh, presentation and uh, our conversation. Thank you very much for coming in. Uh, delighted to have you here. Uh, I hope that the people on the other end